Hello again, everybody, and welcome to InsideLowell.com, the inside view with Teddy Panos. I am your host, Teddy Panos, coming to you live from the Inside Lowell studios here on Merrimack Street in beautiful, historic downtown Lowell. Excited for our guest today. A lot of discussion around the city of Lowell regarding the school department and who better to chat with than well, one of the members of the school committee that's right in the middle of that discussion. She's also the vice chair of the school committee, Jackie Doherty. We'll bring her in in a quick moment. Just want to thank all of you for joining us, whether you're watching us on uh, the day we recorded, Friday, February 10th, or at some point in the future, we're glad to have you here. Want to thank our sponsors as well uh, for making this podcast and all of our Inside Lowell products and services possible. Our friends at Washington Savings Bank in Lowell Historic Bank, now on their 136th year of operation. They've got a great deal as well for Lowell and Dracut residents, an exclusive offer for you. If you live in Lowell, you live in Dracut, you open up a new account, and deposit $1,000 in direct deposits within a period of a month. Uh, that could be your paycheck, that could be your social security check. Get $1,000 into that new account you open, they're gonna give you $300 back. 30% return on your money, you can't even get that on a stock market, on a hot stock. Take advantage of it right now. They're giving you $300. Go to WashingtonSavings.com. Visit them in person. They're right on the corner of Middlesex Street and Central Street here in downtown Lowell. They've also got a branch in Drake. It, hence, you folks in Drake it are welcome to this offer as well. WashingtonSavings.com, Washington Savings Bank. Thank you as well to our friends at Reverie 73. You know, the cannabis industry, kind of new, still new here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and lots of folks, yours truly, very kind of confused about the products. And we, quite frankly, we have a hard time differentiating one dispensary from another. Not the case at Reverie 73. The store itself stands out. It's beautiful, it's relaxing, it's calm. The staff is bright, it's knowledgeable, and they'll take the extra time to answer any questions that you might have. So whether you're new to the world of cannabis or a canna connoisseur, the team at Reverie 73 is sure to elevate your cannabis experience. Visit them at 1148 Bridge Street in Lowell or order online at reverie73.com. And last but certainly not least, our friends at Hafner, so many services, home heating services, whether it's heating oil or propane, their gas stations, you see the signs, the kicking mule, look behind me over there, they're easy to spot, uh, but also their car washes. And that's where I'm going right after I record this podcast. I need to get my car washed. I'm going to the Hafner's Car Wash. They've got a car wash club that'll save you a ton of money over the course of the winter season and the summer season. You want your car to look good when you're going on those beach trips and whatnot. Uh, call 866-IT-KICKS to learn more. 866-IT-KICKS or visit Hafner's.com. And with that, I turn my attention to my guest uh, this morning <laughs> because we are recording this on Friday morning, February 10th. As I said, Lowell School Committee woman, chair, vice chair of the school committee, Jackie Doherty. Good morning, Jackie. Welcome your first appearance here on Inside Lowell. Uh, good morning, Teddy. Thanks so much for inviting me. And, and I set you up. I didn't tell you that this was going to be no. recorded on video as well. <laughs> but you look great. You should see the rest of my guests. And if I showed you the other podcast, you'd think you overdressed for the occasion. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> so I won't worry too much about appearances. All right. You look you look fine. And I'm glad you're here joining us this morning. Uh, lots going on uh, out right. there. First, I want to I want to just get your quick comments on uh, something I reached out to you about a week ago regarding uh, election. It is, uh, you know, what? what we now eight months from a potential primary yes, February, yep. uh, 10 months from an election you are once again going to run for school committee and you have uh, told us you're going to run as an at-large yes i am in the race this work is very important to me it's something i care deeply about so yes even with all the challenges that you've had to face and we got a lot of stuff going on that we're going to talk about this yeah. morning you still you still enjoy it you still love it um i wouldn't say i enjoy the <laughs> The conflict. Uh, I just think that it's meaningful work. It's making a difference. It's an opportunity uh, for me to help improve the district, which I care very much about this city and the education of our children. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about the budget. There was a, a meeting on Monday night, a special meeting that was called to uh, give out some uh, bonus money to uh, 
teachers and, and other staff, if I have this correctly, based on their work during the period of COVID. Uh, a lot of folks question, why was that done in a special meeting as opposed to on a regular Wednesday night meeting? The insinuation being you folks were trying to sneak one past <laughs> the citizens and the taxpayers. No, it actually was more of efficiency thing. We had already decided we were going to have a special meeting about the vote for outside counsel because mm -hmm. that has been going on for over two months. So the thing was, we had met in executive session about the recommendation to move forward with these payments. And we thought, well, we're going to be in open session Monday. We can move forward at that time. It wasn't, it wasn't the meeting for that purpose. The meeting was initially for the purpose of the uh, outside council. Okay. So, and, and what was the final decision? How did you decide who was going to get bonus pay, which uh, if I have it correctly, it's a, a up the eligible employees are able to get a, about $125 a month up to $2,500 right. in total for their work during COVID. Who qualifies, teachers or other staff members? All staff members qualify. I don't know how much, because we did discuss it in executive session, but we took the vote on the floor. Mm -hmm. So really what was on the floor was that we had the funds available and um, we knew the city was doing something similar, and the thinking was, uh, right now, staffing is so critical with the pandemic and shortages that we want to, you know, retain the people who have been committed to us and been on the front lines during this difficult time. So, do do they have? With that said, uh, <laughs> when when does the money get paid out? Does it all get paid out at the end? It, so you make sure that you're able to retain them. Because if you if you pay the bonus up in front and then somebody leaves, can you recoup any of it? Actually, I don't know that the answer to that question. <laughs> That's a very good question. And if you look at the motions, they were separated by the different unions. You know, so you see that everybody's getting some of that. Um, but I I really don't I. I'm assuming the plan is to pay them up front yeah. because we have the money now. Maybe if you can convert it into some kind of an incentive to keep them on, that would... Uh, right. <laughs> good luck on that one with Paul. Right. <laughs> those, those great guys are tough negotiators. <laughs> Where is the money coming from? Is that money going to be from the ESSER funds or from the oper no, operational that is, budget? No, that's... Um, we, the way our uh, COA refers to it is it's uh, vacancy a savings. So it is funds... I think primarily for positions. So in, for instance, if you left and you had 20 years in the district and we hire a replacement who's four years out of school, there's going to be a savings. Mm -hmm. We're not paying you as much. If we had a position that we didn't fill, there's a savings. And even if you started in December, there's a savings because we weren't paying you for August, September. You know, our budget runs June 30th mm -hmm. is the end of our fiscal year. But if if you end up hiring somebody and filling that position, don't you create yourself a, a situation where now you're spending more from the operational budget? I guess my question is, why not just do it from the ESSER money? Isn't that what the ESSER money was for? Okay, so there are time limitations on these different funds. So ESSER has a clock ticking that's going to run out. We have to spend it by a certain amount of time. So does ARPA, by the way, the money mm -hmm. the city has. We have a shorter timeline with money that's in our current fiscal budget. By the end of June 30, money that we haven't spent either goes back to the city or we have a, we can put it in a special education fund to use for other purposes going forward. But it's, it's more limited. It's more constricted. So the thinking was, and again, this is administration advising us moving forward, that if we use this money that we have while we have it for this purpose, uh, I mean, there's no doubt... Uh, People were stressed, through everyone, sure. uh, and our staff, our teachers in particular, trying to do hybrid teaching, trying to learn remote teaching on the fly, all those things. Um, it's been a tough couple of years. I don't have to tell you that. You so know. so where, where is the plan to spend the ESSER money? Because that, as you said, that has a deadline, so that has to get spent as well. And that they're very specific on where right. that can be spent. So do you have... Other places, has the school committee, the school administration decided on where to spend all of that ESSER money? Yes, and we're working in a bunch of different areas. We're looking at trying to fill the gaps in learning that our children face because of the pandemic. And I'll give you one example. Like we used to have summer school at specific schools. 
now we've expanded our we've expanded our school year into all schools at all levels and that i mean i think it's i just asked for a report on it we haven't gotten it yet but i think it's like four times the size of our previous summer school plus programming expanded instead of just having you know academics we've added enrichment and art and things that are going to make it i mean think about it as a kid the last thing you want to do is go to school in the summer right but to make the mornings and they're in the morning so that it the hot part of the day you're not there mm -hmm. so those are the kinds of things we've been talking about and spending and adding positions more social workers things like that to deal with the anxiety the mental health mm -hmm. concerns we've seen among our students um and we're still working out some of those details some of that money's go gone towards facilities uh working with the city to do work that has desperately been needed to be done for a while or to expand our space and you're comfortable that all of that, uh, all, the plan for that ESSER money all falls under the guidelines from, oh, from yeah. DC we're, and how you're supposed to spend right. it. Right. We're working very closely with our administrators to make sure that we fall within the guidelines. Obviously, we don't want to have a plan and then have the government say, no, you can't use that money that way. Uh, but so it's it's been a... a unique opportunity for someone like myself who got into the school committee work as a parent in the early 2000s when we were cutting positions like a hundred positions because we didn't have money to actually have some funding and say what's the smartest way to spend this money that's going to have the longest impact on our kids and our staff all right, let's switch gears to the other discussion you had Monday night uh, besides where to spend that money. And that, of course, was the human resources situation. Uh, the city is a buzz. <laughs> so yes. there, there are folks on the on the city side, the council side, wondering what, what the heck yeah. is going on. What can you tell us? Look, Jackie, I, I, what, what's going on and why the need to hire outside counsel and, and everything else going on? So I'd like to start by saying really what's at the heart of this issue is to protect the city and make sure that the district is following fair hiring practices. I don't have to tell you, you own a business. You know how imp important good employees are to you. So we are in the business of educating students. It's a very important job we have for the future of the city and for our families. We rely on staff more than most businesses do. We don't have a product. We're not selling a gadget. We're teaching kids. And so this idea of being able to attract and re keep quality people means you run a uh, an employment operation that is fair, that employees feel supported and heard. So the the issue came before us on November 20. Well, it was emailed to us at that time by the former city solicitor mm -hmm. that a number of people had come forward with complaints, with different allegations. Um, and we did finally get that letter put up, but that wasn't until the meeting Monday, but the, the newspaper printed it before that. Sure. So I think people, if you've, you've had a chance, I think uh, it's been out there. Um, and during, in that letter, she advised us to get outside counsel, which is not that unusual when you think about, it happens a lot in other communities. I mean, I was doing just a little quick Google last night, but uh, in the last like October, November, you had communities, Brookline, they went outside and did an investigation on somebody in the police department, um, Westminster, you know, and when you have a department that there may be some merit to the allegations, but you're intrinsically part of the community, uh, there's a lot of reasons for going outside. The, right away, there's that sense of it's an objective, independent review. If there's something there, we're going to get advice on how we should move forward. If there's substantiated, uh, the allegations are substantiated to be a problem, we're hiring this outside counsel to be our attorney. They represent us. They will advise us. And the people will know, the people who have come forward, uh, the people who are watching this, all the other employees in our district who we care about, they will see we're doing our due diligence to find out if there's something there to get a complete objective view of what's going on. Why can't this investigation be handled internally? Well, I think for the reasons I 
just mentioned, and also as my colleague Stacy Tom, we've discussed this in various uh, um, venues of those meetings we've had. Um, it explained it very well when she pointed out because in the city solicitor's letter, she mentions that some have already experienced retaliation, trying to bring it forward through the proper channels. Um, that she w thought they should have what they call uh, the whistleblower protection, sure. the status of keeping their co their confidentiality to protect them. Um, and so that idea of having it go outside kind of provides that firewall. So that insinuates that there have been complaints. That is the insinuation. There have been multiple It's not an insinuation. Complaints. It's a letter that there were multiple complaints. The, the solicitor sent the letter. Right. The other night, the current solicitor insinuated there's no paper trail, there's no paperwork. How can you have complaints that rise to the level of an investigation, whether internal or by outside counsel, and no paper trail? What, what is supposed to be investigated? Well, I, my understanding is when we get the outside counsel named, those the city solicitor, as well as the people that she will name, will be told to the outside investigation, the outside uh, firm. We have no need to know those names due to the confidentiality protection, and nor does the current city solicitor. The outgoing, uh, I, I, wouldn't the outgoing solicitor who were under the assumption, she knows the names, she knows the, the instances, correct? Right. Why wouldn't she leave records behind for her replacement? She knew she was leaving. She gave a long notice. Why wouldn't I, she leave records behind? Why wouldn't the current solicitor have access to that information? I can't speak for her specifically answering that. Why I can tell you what we were told, our understanding of that, that it really is about the protection of those individuals and keeping the investigation separate from the city, having it be done by an outside Firm. Do we know when the outgoing solicitor now would be Christine O'Connor, who's now the town council for North Andover? When did she become aware of this? Some folks have questioned the timing. Her letter was literally she was heading out the door. I think it was right. her last day or right. one of her last days at work. She submitted that letter, which has now gone public. Does she indicate when she became aware of this situation and thought it was serious enough to require outside counsel, which she's she's the one who originally recommended that, correct? Yes. And we did discuss that. That she explained to us that the timing, I mean, it is what it is. It's not would have been my preferred time either, believe me. But it came forward before she had given her notice. And in that process of, you know, get, following up on, so it the time went, the clock ran out that she was leaving. It, it wasn't like, and that would come out in the investigation too. Right. Because when we hire the outside counsel, they're going to be looking at the merits of all the, the testimonies. So I think that... Okay. Is, I've heard some rumblings that there are actual suits that have already been filed. Now, there are constantly, the law department deals with suits against the city, the school department. It's almost on a constant basis. There's some active case or another. But... I've heard some information that there are actual suits already in process, litigation already in process, involving some of these accusations. Can you confirm or deny I'm that? not aware of any suits. And, I, and again, I'm speaking from my own speculation here. I think that these people, and my understanding is they're more than one. It is plural. Um, I, the way I look at it, if they wanted to sue us, they would have gone their own attorney or perhaps even gone to some agency, MCAD, whatever the complaint was. The fact that they went, they kept it inside the city and went to the city solicitor, to me, I think indicates we're looking for some fairness. We're looking for change. Um, I know if it were me, I, I would want to see the system improve. That's my motivation in being here with you today. Right. I'm looking to so, make it better. So to your knowledge, uh, these individuals, these employees went to the city solicitor with their complaints. Well, that's what she says. They, they came okay. to her. Why? Is there any indication why they wouldn't go to the school department? The school department has legal counsel in, independent of the city solicitor, correct? We we have our um, labor attorney 
who also oversees HR. Uh, we have special education attorneys who work with our students, staff around things like that. She says, well, I'm sorry, the question was about why what, wouldn't they have gone? Yeah, why wouldn't well, they I, I think it's in, ha handle it within the school department, which has its own side. And I, I would imagine you have policies for you, right. you see something reported to a superior, whether right. it's, so it's I a think principal that or whatever. That when she talks about specific, and I, by that I mean the letter from the city solicitor, the former city solicitor, mm -hmm. There's mention of claims of retali retaliation. Again, claims of retaliation, claims that supervisors and certain members of central office. So, my understanding of that is that some of these people, I don't know if all of them, try to go through the the typical channels. You know, what's your escalation point, right? You go to your boss, nothing gets done. What's the next step after that? Do we know that uh, they, if if they went, perhaps they went to their boss, and again, I'm just kind of playing devil's advocate. Right, here. right. Perhaps they went to their boss, the boss, whoever did some kind of a investigation and didn't find any merit to them. Is it potentially that this is the situation here that we're seeing? That maybe there was some type of an investigation beforehand? Do you, do you have any information on I that? I don't have information on that, but I think that there is always the potential that there, there's not merit to go much further. We don't know what we don't know. So the, again, the idea of going outside, let's get an independent review and then come to us, our attorney that we've hired that specializes in this stuff and tell us what you found. Is there a systemic problem? That's my fear. That the, because it's multiple allegations about different kinds of problems. I mean, in the letter we talk about our hiring policies, DESE regulations, and state law that potentially these three areas could have been impacted. That's a systemic problem that we would, would be a, a big issue for us. But if the review comes back, you know, it's not, it's this, it's that. These are some suggestions of how to remedy it. We don't know until we get the, the study done. You and your colleagues, and you're the only one of the seven here, so you're, right. <laughs> you're going to have to answer for, for them. But I am just speaking for myself, okay. though, because you know there's been, there have been people who have not supported doing anything. Correct. You've, but you've had multiple session, meetings about Nine. this. Executive, executive sessions about Two this. Two executive sessions, okay. three personnel. I mean, literally, I did the... The dates, it's unbelievable. Nine meetings in two months. Has anyone asked the superintendent or the potentially involved people in the administration about these allegations and whether they're true? I'm assuming that you know something about the allegations or you and your colleagues know something by this point about the allegations. Has anybody asked to see, to kind of get the administration side on what they know, how they handled it, if at no, all? No, because we don't, we're not moving forward on the specific cases until we get the information from in the investigation. We have had, I mean, we've all heard complaints, right? I mean, I consider my role, one of it is the bridge between the community and the administration and, and oftentimes the staff and the administration, you know, people come to us. And I think my colleague, Ms. Del Rossi, has been the most outspoken, who someone who used to teach, you know, before mm -hmm. she got on the school committee, saying she's aware of major issues. Well, I take that as absolute, like, why wouldn't we be doing an investigation? Because if we do nothing, nothing changes. But this is the this is the part I have a question with. You're, it's your job as the school committee, the, the six of you and the mayor, to kind of oversee this stuff. I would think somebody would ask the question, if one of your colleagues, as you just said, actually says she has information and is aware of certain Problems, violations, right. wouldn't? Isn't it her job to ask? Isn't it the rest of the committee's job to get to the bottom of it before this goes to uh, outside counsel? That's why I'm, I'm surprised at how little knowledge seems to be known. I, I'm a curious creature. That's why I do interviews. But I, I would certainly be going to Dr. Boyd, whether it's in a, in a coffee shop or in an executive session, saying, hey, what's going on here? Are we going to get sued or whatever? And at least see the other side of the story. It's just, it's strange to me that there's very little information that seems to be known. And yet, at the same time, there seems to be enough information known that you're willing to put on the extra expense of hiring an outside counsel. Right. Well, again, I'm going on the recommendations of the former city solicitor. And I think that this idea of we haven't 
got information of who's being who's being targeted or pin, not targeted, but you know what I mean? Like pinpointed as the cause or the, you know, we don't know any of that yet until we get the information. So you don't know who the potential, well, I don't want to say only criminal, by the letter. The yeah. And, and whether it rises to crime, I don't, we don't know that, but only by what the letter tells us, which is giving us a scope that it's several people. It could be various areas. Um, and, there have been retaliations already experienced. Central office has been named. That's the, you know, the kind of the corporate heart of the organization. Um, but other than that, no. It sounds like if there is validity to these charges, it's a fireable offense. Some people have speculated, look, there's a bunch of folks who've been trying to get this superintendent out since the day he started. Uh, is, that, is that fueling this to any level? I would say my motivation, like everything I do, is what's best for the district, what's best for our kids. Um, these people came forward. Uh, it's our responsibility to see if there's merit there. And that is the ultimate. And, and the talk of protecting the city, loss, like this is the way to protect the city, to say we are going to do our due diligence and find out if there's any merit. If these, if these are substantiated allegations, what do we do to remedy it, to go forward in a way that protects the district so, and our employees? To so know. to repeat that again, to your knowledge, there is not already actual suits regarding this matter. I don't know about suits. Filed against the no. city. Okay, because it, it would seem like at this point, if it protect the city, it's too late for that if the suits have been filed. Right. But, um, and the courts will find out whatever is uh, legitimate or not. How soon do you expect this to, to resolve itself? How, do you have a timetable where this needs to play out for the, for the good of the well, district? Well, we voted uh, Monday night at the February 9th meeting to choose an attorney uh, at our next meeting, which is Wednesday. Okay. What is that, the 15th? What's the scope of the investigation that you would be comfortable with? How far in should they delve? Should, so, they, go, should they go on an expedition looking for other potential issues or just to investigate the specific things that we will so eventually we, find out about? What we talked about, and is, again, it's based very much on the city solicitor's letter, the former city solicitor's letter, that we want to interview the key stakeholders, you know, interview the complainants, in, you know, that the investigator would talk to these people that have already come forward. They would get those names from the former city solicitor, um, any of the administration that are, you know, are relevant. They would be asking, say, you know, the superintendent, the hiring manager, what you know, whatever degree to get the scope to address those allegations and come back to us with a report and recommendations. And it would be directly to the school committee. Okay. They, we have by law, the statutory law, the right to hire our own attorney. And again, I think there are many examples where other communities have done these kinds of investigations and gone outside. It's just a objective. And I'd like to know what any other concerns you have about this, because you said you were, you had mixed feelings about what part worries you? Well, it, it, the, the, the lack of a paper trail. I'm puzzled by okay. the way this it, went there down a originally. That right. there is, somebody has to know who the complainants are. Um, and I would think it's the job of the, of the city solicitor to kind of have this information. You, lawyers keep paper trails all the time. Right. Trust me, you have a deal with one, they, you know, they bill you by the quarter hour, let alone. So they keep very good paper trails. I know. <laughs> I can't believe that the the solicitor left at the end of November. We've had now, this, but there was an interim acting solicitor for a couple of months. Now we have a new one that started a couple of weeks ago. And she says there's no documents. Right. That, that so, to me is stunning. And, and, and talk about something opening up because there, if there is misdeeds here, but nobody can find right. it, that's you know. I would assume at some point, uh, you know, somebody's going to ask the former solicitor Christine O'Connor what she knows and when she knows. Oh, that's going to be right. I would think she's one of the first people that whoever we hire will be reaching out to. But I think the other piece of that to understand, at least from my perspective and I'm just talking from my perspective here. So when the uh, former city solicitor left and we had this email uh, that was not put on the agenda and then we had a joint motion, this was back in December 7th, that was taken off the agenda, which is unprecedented, unauthorized. 
from the beginning, there has been such resistance um, and delay. And we were told, and by the actions it was demonstrated, that the law department really didn't have the bandwidth to take this on. We were told that. And every you know, all these delays and just we said, OK, you know, you're down to two. They had two lawyers mm -hmm. at that time. And I believe even then they lost one other one who did have the information and was not bringing it forward, who, who was still employed at the time with the city. And we, we said, just give us a scope of services and some recommendations of attorneys. That was what we're, it's not a heavy lift. And you just mentioned about, imagine having nine meetings with an attorney to get those two things and still not get it over two months. And not just you having nine meetings with your attorney, but seven people, all of us, and the recording secretary going out nine different, it, it, and then at the ninth meeting, February 6th, this started at our December 7th meeting. Two months later, we're told we should pump the brakes on this. It's concerning. It really is. It makes me feel like I wouldn't even be pushing for that paper trail right now. You know, like at the time, what happened to the city law department? I don't understand. I don't know. I'm not privy to why everybody left or what, but I think it's you worried about lawsuits to the city. I think, yeah, it's a legitimate concern, but not on what we're trying to do and what's happening over there. All right. So uh, stay tuned, <laughs> as they say, is the best you can tell us at this point Thank on you. the specifics. All right. Jackie Darty, a uh, little school committee woman uh, seeking re-election, by the way, uh, this fall as an at-large school committee member, also the vice chair of the school committee. I want to thank you for joining us here in the studios. Thanks for telling us what you could. And I, I do understand a lot of this uh, with, when you get to personnel matters and legal matters. There's a lot of stuff you have to be careful about saying we didn't get you in trouble did we i hope not we'll find out as soon as i <laughs> post this on the website and social media all right thank you for joining us Thanks, we'll, we'll uh, talk many times i'm sure between now and the fall and uh maybe another two years that you have to deal with me okay all right and we want to thank all of you for joining us here on the inside view uh check out all of our content we break news all the time feature stories sports entertainment you name it we've got it inside lol.com is your one-stop shop but you can also find us on facebook twitter instagram we're on linkedin we've got a youtube channel this podcast also going to be on spotify and google podcasts and someday soon even apple podcasts inside lol we're all over the places we like to say if lol is your home this is your place thank you to our sponsors washington savings bank check them out online washingtonsavings.com they want to give you 300 dollars $300 simply for putting $1,000 in direct deposits into a new account you open there. 30% on your money. Don't pass this up. You've only got to the end of March to take advantage of it. Thank you as well to our friends at Hafner's. Take the worry out of heating your home this winter season. I know it's been mild, but eventually we're going to get another cold spell here. Hafner's reliable, efficient, friendly service 24-7. Call 866-IT-KICKS or visit Hafner's.com to learn more. And thank you last but certainly not least to our friends at Reverie 73, their mission statement to listen, explain, inspire, and delight. They've got a location at 1148 Bridge Street in Lowell. Beautiful shop, friendly, knowledgeable staff, ready to help you whether you're uh, new to the world of cannabis or a canna connoisseur, as they like to say. They're also opening two new shops in 2023, one in Beverly, one in Gloucester. Uh, order online, learn more, reverie73.com. Uh, with that, we're signing off for this podcast. Got a lots more to come. We will in the coming weeks chat with Lowell School Superintendent Dr. Joel Boyd as well. See what he knows about this. And maybe by the time we chat with him, we'll know a little bit more as well that we can ask about. Till then, everybody stay safe out there, gang. <laughs>